Hey everyone, welcome back. We're still in unit 4.2, Evolution and Natural Selection. But now we've moved on to the last part of notes, part four, taxonomy. So to, sum or to summarize and review, we talked about what evolution is. We talked about how Darwin came up with the theory of evolution while on his voyage to South America in the Galapagos Islands. We talked about his five key observations that led to his conclusions. And then we went on and talked about how there is strong evidence for evolution involving analyzing um, the fossil record, studying homologous structures and vestigial organs, as well as comparing DNA of different species. And we also discussed how natural selection is what allows for populations of different organisms to change over time so that they are more bet more better is not correct <laughs> language they are better suited to survive in their environment all right so now we're going to move on to something called taxonomy let's move in do 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 come on those little arrow things come on i can't find my little arrow things where are they Ah, uh, let's try this one more time. You guys know technology doesn't always get along well with Miss Komar. <sighs> oh, why are you now? Oh, there we go. Okay. So I apologize for that. Me, technology, we are not friends. So anyways, taxonomy. Taxonomy is a discipline of classifying organisms and assigning each organism a universally accepted name. So this is what happens, or I shouldn't say what happens, but when new organisms are found, we try to figure out what group it fits into. Is an animal, is it a plant, is it a bacteria, is it a fungus, etc. And then from there, we also keep trying, okay, so it's an animal, but what kind of animal? Is it an invertebrate or is it a vertebrate? If it's a vertebrate, is it cold blooded or warm blooded? Does it have scales or smooth skin or feathers? Does it um, have gills or no gills? So taxonomy is us trying to classify the different organisms and different species. And yeah, we do assign them universally accepted names. What we mean by that, it's those scientific names you may have heard and learned about us at different points. There we go. So Carolus Linnaeus, that's this dude right here. He was the guy who came up with our ways of naming organisms, which we call binomial nomenclature, as well as classifying organisms. The form or system of classification that we use is called the hierar hierarchical system of classification. So we will go into both of those, what they mean, how they work, but I at least wanted to let you know that we attribute the, these systems, which we still use today, back to Carolus Linnaeus. All right, so let's start by talking about his system of classification. Oh, no, sorry, we're talking about binomial nomenclature first. So binomial nomenclature is the scientific name, as we've already said. Um, it is a two-part name. That's what binomial means, two parts, two words, and nomenclature refers to the process of naming. So binomial nomenclature is where we use two part scientific name and we do this based on some of the levels of classification which we're going to get into shortly so we always use the two smallest levels of organization the genus and the species a lot of times we'll write the genus as a capital letter and the species as lowercase so humans we are in the genus homo we are in the species sapiens so our scientific name is homo sapiens also, when it's typed out, we do tend to italicize it. 
So here are some examples. It does also talk a little bit about the other higher levels of classification. We're not gonna worry about those right now. So here we have a beaver. I believe it's a beaver, it looks like a beaver. And its genus species name or its scientific name is Castor canadensis. So Castor is the genus level of classification. Canadensis is its species level. So we put those two smallest together and we get Castor canadensis. Here we have this pretty black and yellow bird. I'm not a bird expert, I'm not an ornithologist. I don't know exact the common name of that bird, but its scientific name is Icterus galbula. So again, Icterus galbula, that's the genus and the species name. Here we have a particular type of dragonfly. Its scientific name based on genus and species, Gomphus spicatus. Now you already know some of the other ones as well. A lot of times you hear on the news about E. coli contamination in different types of foods like um, romaine or lettuce. E. coli is actually the scientific name for a type of bacteria. Now they abbreviated it. Um, the E is short for Escheridia. So the genus is Escheridia and the species is coli. So Escheridia coli or abbreviated E period coli. So going back here, if we look at the beaver, Castor canadensis, that can be abbreviated to a capital C period canadensis. So it'd be C canadensis. The bird could be I galbula. The dragonfly could be G spicatus. All right. All right. Now let's talk about the system of classification. All right, so the hierarchical system of classification looks at how we group organisms and it always starts with the biggest, broadest topic and then it slowly narrows it down to the most specific. So we start broad, we end um, very specific. Now we're gonna focus on the seven main levels there are more than seven. You also have domain and sub kingdoms and super domain or supra phylums and sub phylums. We're not going to worry about all that. We're just going to focus on the seven main ones. So the broadest one is called the kingdom. And then the most specific, the smallest grouping is called species. Now, how it goes is kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Now, I'm not gonna lie, it took me a while to learn that, but I have, I was taught a mnemonic device and I have that at the bottom underneath right here. Kings play cards on fat green stools. So K-P-C-O-F-G-S, kings play cards on fat green stools. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. It helped me out, it might help you out, you might, come up with your own, as long as it helps you remember it, that's all that matters. So again, we start off with the broadest and then we bring it down all the way to the smallest. And I'll show you some examples. So here's an example for the killer whale, also known as Yorka. It is in the kingdom Animalia, in the phylum Chordata. So we start big Animalia, all animals. Chordata are the vertebrates. Class Mammalia, the mammals. Order Cetacea. These are the marine mammals such as whales and dolphins, all the different whales and dolphins. Family Delphinidae. This is looking more at the group closely related to dolphins. So it's just dolphins and killer whales. It doesn't include the blue whale or sperm whale or humpback whale or anything like that. Genus Orcanus. So now we're talking about the larger versions of Delphinidae. Not the little bottlenose dolphins that we think of, but more so what we tend to think of when we think of orcas. Species orca. So the scientific name for a killer whale is Orcanus orca, based on the bottom two, the mo two most specific um, groups of classification. So kingdom, animalia, phylum, chordata, class, mammalia, order, cetacea, Family, Delphinidae, genus, Orcanus, species, 
orca, also known as a, by the scientific name Orcanus orca, or its common name, killer whale. And here's another example. And this kind of also shows you a little bit more about like what it entails. It's very visual. Now, again, we're not going to worry about domains or supergroups or anything like that. So we're just going to start off. This is the guy right here that we are trying to identify. We're trying to classify this guy right here at the bottom. He's in the kingdom Animalia. So that means all animals. So if we look at this, it includes things like, I think that's a cow, ant, rooster, hermit crab, snail, maybe a frog, whatever that is, bird. I mean, all these different things. Everything that is an animal is in the kingdom Animalia. So that is well over 1 million species. Next layer, the phylum, is in the phylum Chordata. Now that's give or take. This chart was done a while ago, so species, we've discovered new things since then. But over 50,000 species are in the phylum Chordata. These are typically thought of as things with backbones. So fish, reptiles, amphibians, birds, mammals, etc. It's in the class Mammalia. There's more than 5,000 species. Again, that number to me seems low, but I'm not a taxonomist. So these are the mammals, things that are warm-blooded, have hair, um, suckle their young, have live births, etc. It's in the order Carnivora. Greater than 270 species. Again, that sounds low to me, but I could be wrong. So these are mammals that are carnivores. Bears, hyenas, the big cats, actually all cats, all the canines, wolves, dingoes, etc. Family Canidae. More than 34 species. So this is like the African um, painted dogs. Foxes, dingoes, coyotes, wolves, etc. Genus Canis. So now these are the canines. There's more than seven species. So dogs, coyotes, wolves, African painted dogs. Species Lupus. One species. And that's our gray wolf. That's his common name. So it went Animalia, Cordata, Mammalia, Carnivora, Canidae, Canis Lupus. Scientific name, Canis lupus, common name, gray wolf. Now notice we speci specify gray wolf because red wolves and other types of wolves, Ethiopian wolves, those all have their own species name. So they have a different classification. Red wolves are not the same thing as gray wolves. They are a different species. So they have their own species name and that means that that last level right there is going to be different for them than it is for the gray wolf. Sorry, it's got an itch on my back. Now you can see in the numbers how it gradually get, starts off very, very big and then gradually gets more and more specific. Even in the pictures, they're showing you that. So that's what we're talking about with the hierarchical system of classification. And again, for binomial nomenclature, we use the two smallest levels, the genus species name or the scientific name. So we are homo sapiens, wolves are canis lupus, dogs are canis familiaris, um, killer whales are orcanus orca. So some examples for you. Now we mentioned kingdoms. There's actually six kingdoms. There are two prokaryotic kingdoms and four eukaryotic kingdoms. Now, if you remember prokaryotes, those are very simple organisms. Um, they lack a nucleus and they lack membrane bound organelles. So there are bacteria. Now there's actually two kingdoms of bacteria. The first one is eubacteria. And this includes different bacteria that we typically think of as bacteria. So streptococcus, E. coli, et cetera. All those different ones that we think of as bacteria that's in the kingdom eubacteria. 
archaea bacteria are ones you will not have much contact with at all unless you are researching them. They're also known as the extremophiles. So they tend to live in environments that are extremely harsh and well, pretty much we're not really going to experience them that often. Deep sea sulfur vents, um, there are certain places where there's no oxygen that they can survive. Very, very high temperatures, very, very acidic environments. Those are where the extremophiles are found. So that's where the archaeobacteria are found. Eukaryotic organisms are more complex. They can be single celled or multicellular as opposed to prokaryotes, which are always single celled. Um, eukaryotic organisms, again, we have a nucleus that surrounds our DNA. We have many different organelles and many of those organelles have their own membranes. So very, very complex. Now there are four, four eukaryotic kingdoms. First one is protista. So these are the protists, also known as slime modes, kelp. Yeah, kelp is not, yeah, it's not a plant, even though a lot of times we think of it as like seaweed or a sea plant, it's actually not. It's an algae, and algae is protista. Um, amoebas, paramecians, a lot of things like that, those are the protists. Fungi, so these are the funguses such as mushrooms, yeast, regular mode, not slime mode, slime mode is different. Um, these are in the kingdom fungi. Plantae are plants, so mosses, ferns, flowering plants, trees, grasses, different things like that. And last but not least, animalia, the one that we are probably the most familiar with because it is our group, it is our kingdom. Now it's not just animals in terms of vertebrates, it's all animals, everything that's considered an animal, all the way up from sea sponges, jellyfish, different kinds of worms, flat worms, round worms, segmented worms, arthropods, um, crustaceans, insects. Let's see, what else? The mollusks. So, and then yes, in or fish, humans, birds, etc. All right, so how do we group things? Well, we talked about, you know, the hierarchical system of classification. Well, how do we put things in there? How do we know like where we should put everything? Well, that's a good question. Why is it that we group things that way? Biologists group organisms into categories that represent lines of evolutionary descent, not just physical similarity. So in a previous section, we were saying how it might seem like bees and bats are most similar because they have similar food sources, they both fly, they're terrestrial organisms, but actually a bat and a dolphin are more closely related because we have to look at not just physical similarities, but also the development of the structures. We have to look at the different body systems and how the organism is put together we have to look at the DNA. Now we have a type of study that focuses on this. It's called phylogeny. So this is the study of evolutionary relationships. Now, a lot of times you'll hear, hey, they found a new organism, a new species. Well, once a new species has been found, that's where phylogenists come in. They actually go and study it and try and figure out, okay, where would it be located? What kind of organism is it? What kingdom would it be in? What phylum or class, et cetera, et cetera. Evolutionary classification looks at more than just appearance. It looks at the function of structures, not just how they look, but also what they do and how they develop. It also looks at DNA evidence. So looking at how much DNA is in common between these organisms. So we have something called the phylo phylogenetic sorry, tree of life. And that's kind of what this is showing here. So this is showing blue is U bacteria and how we can divide up every time it divides, every time there's a split in the line, it means there is a common ancestor here. So there's a common ancestor and then it divided into two groups. One was the aquifex group and the other gave rise to all of these other groups. This common ancestor here that gave, 
gave rise to the thermotogas, the green filamentous bacteria, and then what would become these? Same with here. These are the archaea bacteria. And then over here is the eukaryota or eukaryotic organisms. So the protists, animals, fungi, plants, etc. And here we have some more. So if you look at this, everything comes from a common ancestor. And then it splits into eubacteria and this way. Then we have another split here. So there's a common ancestor between the archaeobacteria and the eukaryotic organisms. And then here we have all these additional splits. This is another way to look at it, although this one's focusing just on animals. So again, common ancestor here, and it gave rise to the sponges and to this common ancestor, which gave rise to the Nidar or this group, which another split, Nidarians and Tinaforans, and then this group, which gave rise to all of these. And over here, another split, the echinoderms, which are starfish, and the chordates, which are organisms with backbones. Common ancestor here that broke into the, this group and this group could come here. Another common ancestor that gave rise to the nematodes, the roundworms, and the arthropods, so things like insects, spiders, crustaceans, etc. We have common ancestor here that gave rise to four different groups. The lophophorates, the flatworms, also known as platyhelminthes, the mollusks, and the annelids, the segmented worms. So that's what we're talking about. If you've seen these tree of lives, these kind of how they split and everything, then that's what, talk, what we're talking about with phylogeny. Now, we don't just group them this way, you know, all willy-nilly, like, yeah, we're just gonna split them. If you look at the top, it actually gives you an ex a reason as to why they split. So sponges are in their own group from this one. When this common ancestor split into two groups, it was on no tissues versus dedicated tissue. So all of these other organisms have dedicated tissues. Sponges do not. And then when we look at this group here, it's radiosymmetry, the radiata, so radiosymmetry versus bilateral symmetry. So how the organism is more one, we can like cut ourselves down the middle and we're roughly mirror images as opposed to the cnidarians and the tinophoras, radio symmetry, you can kind of cut into five and see symmetry on a plane of five. This right here, this common ancestor gave rise to the proteostomes versus the deuterostomes. And then a lot of between these two, backbone or no backbone. Let's see, there's actually more to it. Um, so when we're talking about proteostomes versus deuterostomes, a coelom is a body cavity, and in deuterostomes, it forms into the gut, whereas in these, it does not. It forms into other stuff. I'm not gonna get into that much detail. Now, when we look at the proteostomes, this group, body or growth of increasing body mass, locomotion is ciliary, trochophore, larva. So this is talking about how they grow versus growing by molting. So that's how we divide the groups up. There's actual traits that we look at, which we see at these evolutionary splits. All right. And last thing we're gonna talk about is something called dichotomous keys. Now, the term dichotomous, di meaning two. So here's an example at the bottom. A dichotomous key is a tool that allows the user to determine the identity of items in the natural world. You can use dichotomous keys to identify different trees or flowers or mammals, reptiles, rocks. We don't always have to use them for organisms, fish, etc. You can use them for any number of things. So a lot of it boils down to two choices. Dichotomous means that it's a two division, two part division. So what we mean by that is you're given two choices. All right, I have this organism. 
I know that I've already figured out it's a vertebrae. Does it have feathers? If the answer is no, you go over here. All right, no feathers. Does it have legs? If no, it must be a snake. If yes, it's a lizard. All right, but what if it did have feathers? All right, then we go up here. Does it swim? If yes, it's a duck. If no, it's a hen. So we're following these patterns of two choices that usually involve yes or no, this or that. And you just kind of keep moving down it until you find the answer. Think of it like um, if you've ever read those choose your own adventure stories, it'd be like at the bottom of the page, do you choose or do you go explore the haunted mansion? If yes, go to this page. If no, go to that page. It's very similar to that. So what is it? It's a listing of characteristics such as structure and behavior, and it's organized in such a way that an organism can be identified or classified. It's kind of like a, um, a scavenger hunt. Let's see. Yeah, I don't have. All right. So I'm going to draw something on my board. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> We're going to use a dichotomous key to figure out what it is. All right. This is my picture. We got to figure out what this guy is. So let's take a look at this dichotomous key. Now, I'm already going to tell you, he has a backbone. So that's why we already know he's in the vertebrate classes. All right. Does it have fur or does it not have fur? Hmm. Nope. No fur. So he's not a mammal. That means we're going to come over here and down this way. Does it have feathers or are there no feathers? Hmm. No feathers. So that means it's not a bird. All right. Does it have internal fertilization or external fertilization? Can't tell from this picture, but I'll tell you, it does not have internal fertilization. It is not a reptile. Does it have gills as an adult or does it not have gills as an adult? This is an adult. It has gills. So therefore, it's a type of fish. It's not an amphibian. So that's how these different dichotomous keys work. So as we mentioned on how to use it, at each step, you're um, looking at the key and you're presented two options. Each alternative is going to lead to another question and another until you finally get to an identification. So eventually, when enough questions have been answered, the identity becomes revealed. So here is an example. We have bird W, bird X, bird Y, bird Z. So let's start with bird W. The beak is relatively long and slender. The beak is relatively stout and heavy. Well, it's definitely not slender. It's kind of long, but definitely not slender. So I'm gonna to go to question two. The bottom surface of the lower beak is flat and straight. The bottom surface of the lower beak is curved. Well, if you look at the bottom surface of the lower beak, definitely more straight. So that means it's gonna be this one, geospiza. All right, how about bird X? So beak long and slender or stout and heavy? Definitely more stout. So we're going to go to question two. Is the bottom surface of the lower beak, well, we already know it's not geospiza because we already figured out who geospiza is. Bottom surface of the lower beak is curved. Yeah, look at that, nice curve. So that means go to question three. The lower edge of the upper beak has a distinct bend or the lower edge of the upper beak is mostly flat. Well, here's the lower edge of the upper beak. It's flat. So that means bird X is flatty spiza. All right, bird Y, uh, definitely a long and slender beak. So that one's easy. Bird Y is Certhidiae. Bird Z, well, we know it's not Certhidiae. We also can see that the beak is more stout. So go to question two. We know it's not geospiza, so we're going to go to question three. Lower edge of the upper beak has a distinct bend. So if you look at the lower edge of the upper beak, look how it's kind of curved. So it has that distinct bend. This is 
Kemar Hinkus. I'm probably saying that wrong, but you know what I'm trying to say. So that's how you use dichotomous keys. And this is just showing you again another example. We've done in a few examples, so we're not going to worry about looking at this one. All right. So then that brings us just to our additional resources. Woo! So in science and pajamas, we have um, a video on dichotomous keys. We have a video on taxonomy. So it's all that fun stuff. this to me. Yeah. Right. I don't know why the little thingy isn't popping up. So, you know what? We're just going to do this the old fashioned way. So, we have a video on taxonomy. We also have a video on looking at dichotomous keys. So how to use them, how to solve them, all that fun stuff. And then with the other videos, I'm not gonna go and show each individual one because I'm having technical difficulties. We do have an Amoeba Sisters video on classification. There's one by Crash, Crash Course Biology that focuses on all of taxonomy, and then Amoeba Sisters dichotomous keys. Definitely check some of these out as part of your lesson. I would definitely recommend you check some of these out because they are going to be very, very useful in helping you to delve deeper and understand the material. But in the meantime, if you have any questions at all, please let me know. Hit me up in our Google Classroom, hit me up in email, or ask me in class. So you guys, in the meantime, like I said, check out some of the videos, consider that part of your lesson, and stay awesome, stay healthy, and until next time, you guys, take care. Bye-bye.